Good morning, I'm Nathan Hager. And I'm Karen Moscow. Here are the stories we're following today. We want to begin this morning with an antitrust ruling that threatens to upend the mobile app economy. A federal jury in San Francisco has ruled in favor of video game developer Epic Games, declaring that Alphabet's mobile app store has a monopoly over distribution of programs and payments on its Android software. Like Apple's app store, Google Play charges up to 30% commissions for users, and it generates close to $200 billion a year. Bloomberg executive editor Peter Elstrom says this was a surprise ruling after Epic lost a similar case against Apple two years ago, but he says there are some key differences. Google had a whole series of special deals that it was cutting with different companies for different fees within the App Store. For example, Spotify, the music service, essentially bypassed the fees from the Google App Store. In many cases, companies pay 30% fees. So the argument was that uh, Google actually had something that they called Project Hug, where they were trying to keep the most important apps within the store, not go to rival stores that could compete against them in the Google Play Store. And Epic argued that this was anti-competitive behavior Bloomberg's Peter Elstrom says Alphabet plans to appeal the decision. Epic didn't seek financial penalties, but it is looking for changes to the Google Play Store. Well, we turn to Washington now, Nathan, where the focus is on geopolitics and the fight over foreign aid in Congress. Ukraine's President Vladimir Zelensky is in Washington for a two-day visit. He spoke alongside Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin at the National Defense University yesterday. Russia's war on Ukraine isn't just about, isn't just about some old fashioned dictatorship trying to settle scores, real or imagined. It's not just Moscow trying to split Europe again. It's Putin. Putin attacking that big shift that happened back in 1989. And President Zelensky also met with the head of the International Monetary Fund, Kristalina Georgieva, who announced the dispersal of $900 million in aid. Zelensky meets today with President Biden and Republican lawmakers. They refused to budge on about $60 billion in new assistance without funds for the southern border. Well, Karen, the focus is also on the other major global conflict in the Middle East. President Biden is warning Israel that public support for its war against Hamas could shift as the civilian death toll mounts in the Gaza Strip. The president is still backing Israel's fight. As I said after the attack, my commitment to the safety of the Jewish people and the security of Israel and its right to exist is independent, as an independent Jewish state is is unshakable. President Biden spoke at a White House Hanukkah reception as his administration pushes Congress for new aid. Meanwhile, Nathan, last week's congressional testimony over campus anti-Semitism continues to royal higher education. More than 700 faculty members at Harvard University have signed a petition urging school leadership to resist political pressures, including calls for the removal of President Claudine Gay. More than 1,000 students and alumni, including billionaire donors like Bill Ackman, are demanding the school replace her. And this morning, sources tell the school's newspaper, the Harvard Crimson, that Gay will remain in office after receiving backing from the university city's highest governing body. Gay and the heads of MIT and the University of Pennsylvania struggled to say directly that calling for the genocide of Jews violates school harassment policies. Liz McGill stepped down as Penn's president over the weekend. Sticking with politics, the Supreme Court has agreed to hear former President Donald Trump's claims of presidential immunity over the special counsel's 2020 election interference case. Bloomberg's Ed Baxter has that story. Special counsel Jack Smith filed a motion saying it goes to the heart of democracy. Whether Donald Trump or any other president has what Trump has claimed as absolute immunity. Trump filed an appeal that would go to an appellate court, but Smith petitioned the highest court in the land to try to get an expedited ruling. It would end up there in any event. The filing marks the first time the court has been asked to intervene in one of these cases on election interference regarding Mr. Trump. Smith has asked for the court to rule during this term, which ends in June. Ed Baxter, Bloomberg Radio. All right, Ed, thanks. Well, elsewhere in politics, ousted former Congressman George Santos is in plea talks with prosecutors, and Bloomberg's Nancy Lyons has the details. Prosecutors say in a filing that they're engaged in discussions with George Santos in hopes of resolving the matter without a trial. Santos was set to appear at a hearing Tuesday. Santos is charged with multiple federal counts of stealing public funds and lying on federal disclosure forms. Two people tied to Santos's congressional campaign, his former fundraiser and former treasurer, have both pleaded guilty to federal charges. In Washington, Nancy Lyons, Bloomberg Radio.
All right, Nancy, thank you. We have some major economic news on the calendar this morning. The November Consumer Price Index comes out at 8.30 Wall Street time. The final Federal Reserve meeting of the year kicks off today, and we get the decision in Chair Jay Powell's news conference tomorrow. Markets are looking for rate cuts next year, but Bloomberg Intelligence Chief U.S. Interest Rate Strategist Ira Jersey thinks Powell is going to push back. The Fed is still in inflation fighting mode, right? And and I think that they don't want the market to think that they're going to be cutting very early because that's loosening financial conditions quite a lot. And because of that, the big risk is to markets uh, on Wednesday is that they say, hey, we're probably not going to cut quite as aggressively as the market's thinking right now. And Bloomberg's Ira Jersey says even if headline inflation meets market expectations, core CPI could remain elevated enough to keep rates on hold well into 2024. Time now to take a look at some of the other stories making news around the world with Bloomberg's Amy Morris. Good morning, Amy. Good morning, Nathan. Firefighters didn't find anyone trapped in the debris of that New York City apartment building yesterday. Part of the seven-story building collapsed, leaving apartments exposed and walls just sheared off. Neighbors are stunned. It came from the top first and it just started falling down everywhere. I just see a lot of stuff just flying down. I didn't even know it was the building falling until I really looked. I was scared. I was, I'm thinking, you know... I hope everybody's okay. Fire officials say two people did suffer minor injuries while they were evacuating the damaged building. After a poll last week showed Mayor Eric Adams' approval rating for a record low 28 percent, there's a new poll showing who could be the person to succeed Adams. Leading the list, former New York Governor Andrew Cuomo. Political consultant Ken Friedman says Cuomo would be a viable candidate, and he tells WABC New York the timing for Adams is just awful. The migrant issue is a, is a terrible problem for any mayor, to be fair. I don't, I, I can't, you know, I've thought about it a lot. And I, you put, you put LaGuardia in office now, I don't think he could handle this or even Giuliani, frankly. Some observers say it's the migrant crisis that's hurting Adams more than anything else. Former Trump lawyer Rudy Giuliani's defamation case is underway in D.C. Giuliani had earlier admitted he spread lies about two Georgia election workers, accusing them of manipulating ballots. But now as the case gets underway, Giuliani now denies that he lied. When I testify, you get the whole story, and it will be definitively clear that what I said was true, and that whatever happened to them, which is it's unfortunate if other people overreacted, but everything I said about them is true. The hearing is to determine how much he owes for spreading the lies about the women. President Biden last week said he was willing to make significant compromises over border policy. Now before Congress breaks for winter recess, Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell told the White House in his Senate floor remarks it would be imperative for any other Senate support. Mr. President, when it comes to keeping America safe, border security is not a sideshow. It's ground zero. McConnell's latest push comes as Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky is scheduled to address the Senate. Global News, 24 hours a day and whenever you want it with Bloomberg News Now. I'm Amy Morris and this is Bloomberg. Nathan. All right, Amy, thank you. Time now for the Bloomberg Sports Update brought to you by Tri-State Audi. Good morning, John Stashauer. Good morning, Nathan. The legend of Tommy Cutlets DeVito continues to grow. It's quite a story. Undrafted rookie quarterback latches on with his hometown team while still living with his parents. He goes from third string quarterback to first. Leads the Giants to three straight wins. Last night, DeVito ran for 71 yards and he completed 17 of 21 passes. One for touchdown. DeVito in a shotgun set. Three receivers left. Barkley to his right. DeVito calls signals and takes the snap. Back to throw. Looks to his right. Rolls to his right. Looking for someone on cover. Throws to the end zone. Touchdown, Giants! Isaiah Hodgins! On WFAN, Giants led the Packers by eight. Green Bay rallied, took the lead on a TD with a minute and a half to go, but DeVito drove the Giants into field goal range, and they won 24-22 on a Randy Bullock 37-yarder. The Giants still just 5-8, and eight, but amazingly, in the NFC, that's only one game out of a playoff spot. There were two Monday nighters, and the Titans and Dolphins also a thriller in Miami. Huge comeback by Tennessee. Down two touchdowns, less than three minutes to go. They scored 15 points. 
A TD, a two-pointer, another TD 51 seconds later. Tennessee won 28-27. Surprising details emerging about the Shohei Otani contract with the Dodgers. It is for $700 million, but all but $20 million will be deferred and paid off starting in 2034. This allows the Dodgers to afford other players, and they're said to be in it for another Japanese import, pitcher Yashinobu Yamamoto, who the Mets and Yankees also covet. The Yanks met with him yesterday. Knicks and Islanders both beat Toronto. The Nets lost in Sacramento. John Stash Hour, Bloomberg Sports. From coast to coast, from New York to San Francisco, Boston to Washington, D.C., nationwide on Sirius XM, the Bloomberg Business App, and Bloomberg.com. This is Bloomberg Daybreak. Good morning. I'm Nathan Hager. We could have a sea change coming to the way we access the apps that make our smartphones more than just phones. A federal jury in San Francisco has found that Alphabet's mobile app store Google Play is a monopoly after a nearly month-long antitrust case with Fortnite maker Epic Games. For more on this, what it could mean for the multi-billion dollar mobile app economy, we are pleased to be joined by Bloomberg News technology reporter Mark Bergen. Uh, Mark, good morning. What are the implications from this victory for Epic Games? Morning. I mean, the implications in 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 one way is that Epic and many other kind of kind of all these apps that that charge for subscriptions or sort of uh, in app services will be um, conceivably able to pass it along to consumers. They'll just they that cut they were making that thirty percent over to Google. Uh, if the policy actually changes, is that something that that they'd no longer have to make? And see so that those companies will either, either have uh, more money to for their own shareholders or that they can actually just uh, charge cheaper rates to consumers. Interesting to uh, see that potential implication when the whole idea of antitrust cases is to try to lower prices for consumers. Uh, But you're thinking that uh, Epic and some other app providers uh, might be the opposite case for them? Oh, no, no. And sorry. I I mean, I presumably they could lower the prices here because this is money that like that's the argument that Epic's been making. Right. That they the reason they have to have say higher fees is because that that they, you know, every time the. Uh, someone buys something within the App Store for a, a 30% goes to Apple, within the Play Store, 30% goes to Google. Uh, and so now they've been arguing in others that they can pass these savings along with cheaper cheaper rates. Uh, pass the savings along. Okay. Yeah, um, for sure. <laughs> to get the miss here there. Um, but Epic lost a similar fight against the Apple App Store uh, two years ago. What made its case against Google Play so different? That's a really interesting question because you know, Google will certainly argue that they are a lot more open than Apple. I, I mean, Apple is. Um, you know, Google has a- Android, which is a much bigger. They have like they have a different Samsung. So they have its own App Store and Huawei. These sort of hardware manufacturers. Uh, Google is th- does allow other app stores to exist on Android phones in a way that that Apple just doesn't on iPhones. Um, I mean, this this you know, it's a different political climate in, in some ways. Like Google is is back against the ropes. Um, on a number of of issues around around antitrust uh, and both with its search position in, in its app store and this is something that that Fortnite has been an epic its owner has been working on for years. So does this verdict have applications then for the Apple App Store or any other uh, providers that offer app stores on their platforms or is it yeah, just I mean, uh, it, uh, uh, you know just for Alphabet? This is I mean this is a this is a two company market in some ways. And in many ways, Apple dominates, right? Uh, so so another company sort of gives us the, the full clarity about how much they make. But um, you know, a lot of estimates show that Apple just makes so much more money from that. its app store. Like iPhone users spend a lot more money. Um, so this is something that uh, could certainly impact Apple. I think, you know, what uh, Epic CEO Tim Sweeney said he's after is not just uh, a legal victory, but he's actually after a policy business practice change. He wants the business models and the app stores to fundamentally change. Uh, and they have been for, for for the past few years, both Apple and Google have lowered the fees they take for some subscription services like Netflix, and and they've made some concessions and, and been forced to make concessions in, in other markets. Um, so I think, you know, we can also see that the, uh, after the ruling, Google came out and said they're they're contesting this. So they're certainly not going down without a fight. How difficult a fight is it going to be, though, on appeal? I mean, we've been speaking to uh, some legal experts that say the uh, the bar is set pretty high for uh, for, for Google to try to overcome the uh, the difficulties it faced at trial. Uh, Google has many well-paid and uh, veteran lawyers. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> and, and outside law firms. 
So I don't doubt that they'll actually have enough kind of uh, illegal firepower to keep fighting this. If this does stand, though, Mark, what kind of hit uh, does Google stand to take uh, from revenue? I mean, 30 percent fees is nothing to sneeze at. Uh, that's correct. But uh, this is still a small portion of their overall business, right? Like this is something this is not impact their cash cow search, search advertising. Um, and then from there, they they make some far more money on like, YouTube ads on display ads across the internet and their cloud business. Um, and, and, you know, this is around the same down in the and the sort of they lump everything together with their hardware businesses like Google Pixel and Nest devices, and then Play Store. So it, it's not insignificant, certainly for for um, any other companies that that's not an alphabet size, um, but as you see, I, I don't. As far as I know, shares didn't um, drop tremendously on this news, and I think that's in part because the the markets are aware that you know Google is. Uh, this behemoth that has a lot of different lines of businesses. And at the same time, uh, Google's facing antitrust action from the Justice Department over search, particularly on cell phones where the App Store or the Google Play Store lives. So in our last minute, could this case have implications for for that case where it's trying to maintain its search dominance on cell phones? I th I mean, this certainly gives... Uh, more ammunition to to critics um, like Epic Games and companies. You know, Spotify has been a critic of the App Store model, and companies that have been kind of willing to come out and and take positions around and com complain to the Justice Department, to the FTC. And so I think, in that political sense, yeah, um, it certainly puts Google further uh, back on its feet. All right. Thanks for this, Mark. Really good to get the clarity on uh, this pretty important decision with uh, Epic Games winning its antitrust fight against uh, Alphabet over the Google Play Store. Uh, Mark Bergen covers tech for Bloomberg News. Now let's turn to geopolitics and the rising stakes for both Ukraine in its defense against Russia and Israel's fight against Hamas. Today... Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky will continue to press his case for renewed aid, multi-billion dollars in aid uh, to his country. He's going to be speaking directly to lawmakers in Washington, while President Biden is warning Israel that public opinion could shift if the war in Gaza continues to take a severe civilian toll. And for more on all this, we're joined by Bloomberg News senior editor Derek Wallbank. Uh, Derek, I know you've been monitoring President Zelensky's trip to Washington. This is day two. He's been speaking to the National Defense University, the International Monetary Fund as well. What should we expect as the Ukrainian president meets today with U.S. President Biden and those lawmakers on Capitol Hill? Well, I think he's got a very tough job ahead of him. Um, the aid to Ukraine is currently stalled amid uh, package negotiations over aid to Israel, as well as Republican demands for increased border security measures. Zelensky walks into that fight, I think, in a much weaker position than he was in the last time that he was in Washington. Remember, he got received with somewhat rapturous crowds. He had addresses to U.S. lawmakers. It was a whole... It was a whole thing, for lack of a more technical term. It's not so much that case right now. I think there is rising skepticism, especially on the right, uh, over the over the war in general. Um, there is somewhat of an increased appetite in Washington. Um, you know, maybe not a majority opinion, but certainly a sizable opinion uh, that that this war uh, needs to find an off ramp. And unfortunately for Zelensky. He's caught a bit between a rock and a hard place because on the on the Washington side, you're talking about a difficulty with Republicans who, in fairness, may be trying to simply extract something rather than actually hold this up indefinitely. On the other side in Europe, you've got he's having problems with Viktor Orban in uh, in Hungary gumming up some of the aid there. And between those two things, you are seeing new aid pledges to Ukraine reach a substantial low compared to where it was earlier this year or even uh, late last year. I mean, we're hearing uh, some of the rhetoric from uh, President Skolinski sounding quite a bit more dire if he doesn't get this aid, talking about the uh, threat it could pose to democracy if uh, Russia's hand were to be improved by Ukraine not receiving this aid. Uh, what what about that? Could that change any minds, do you think, on Capitol Hill, this idea that this is still a fight for democracy in Ukraine? 
Yeah, well, I think the number one mind that I'm particularly interested to see is the new U.S. House Speaker. All right, remember that if we go all the way back, and it's not actually that far back, but to when Kevin McCarthy was Speaker, there were some talks in the last funding uh, as part of the last funding negotiations that Ukraine aid would be brought up at some point. Then, of course, McCarthy stops being speaker. All of his promises go pro- right out the window. And in comes Mike Johnson of Louisiana. Well, Johnson was quite a Ukraine skeptic before he took the speakership and before he started getting those confidential security briefings that speakers do get. Johnson was telling uh, the Wall Street Journal CEO forum just last night that he's going to have a, a, a message for Zelensky to basically say, look, we've got to get all of this done together. He's, he said he's going to tell him the same thing in private that he's saying in public. Sure, fine, that's that's all good. The question that I'm really interested in it is what is Mike Johnson's price for putting something on the House floor? Because if he puts something on the House floor, it's probably going to pass. That's just the math of it. But Johnson's have- got a difficulty because he's he's got he's got to deal with his conference and his conference is going to want things out of this. How much? That's the critical question. What do you make of the uh, continued shift in rhetoric? It seems like we're hearing from President Biden when it comes to the stance toward Israel and the mounting civilian death toll. Well, Joe Biden warned uh, at, at a Hanukkah reception that uh, that public opinion can shift on on the war. Certainly, I think Biden has seen public opinion kind of sour a little bit on his own handling. Some of that is from within his own party. Uh, some of some of his big supporters uh, are are disappointed with how closely he has tied himself to Israel. At the same point, some people on the other side, of the more centrist side of the Democratic Party, would say he hasn't done it enough. So he is in a very difficult political position on this. But as a matter of, of, of straight fact, he is right. You know, there, there is a risk as Israel prosecutes the war that the mounting civilian toll, uh, tolls could create a public, uh, a public relations problem for Israel in some of the countries that are backing them up, specifically in the United States. So mm-hmm. that is a warning that he's been trying to do. But the problem is, is that if you try and politically speaking here, if you try and have it both ways, sometimes you wind up having it neither way. Right. And the White House right now doesn't really have a ton of friends across the political spectrum with how it's been handling this, because each side would say that somebody else is doing it better or yeah. that they're not doing quite enough. This is Bloomberg Daybreak Today, your morning brief on the stories making news from Wall Street to Washington and beyond. Look for us on your podcast feed at 6 a.m. Eastern each morning on Apple, Spotify, and anywhere else you get your podcasts. You can also listen live each morning starting at 5 a.m. Wall Street time on Bloomberg 1130 in New York, Bloomberg 991 in Washington, Bloomberg 1061 in Boston, and Bloomberg 960 in San Francisco. Our flagship New York station is also available on your Amazon Alexa devices. Just say Alexa, play Bloomberg 1130. Plus, listen coast to coast on the Bloomberg Business app, Sirius XM, the iHeartRadio app, and on Bloomberg.com. I'm Nathan Hager. And I'm Karen Moscow. Join us again tomorrow morning for all the news you need to start your day right here on Bloomberg Daybreak.